tonight on Nate Newswatch. The Canadian Finals Rodeo is back in Edmonton and local businesses are cashing in. Yeah, they're, they might be a little bit looser on the purse strings or the wallet, you know, just because they are in the city. Edmonton honors the men and women who fought for our freedom. Really important for me to be here to watch, be able to um, honor the people that did fight for us and the people who are currently fighting for us. Nate students team cooked up a gold medal at the Culinary Olympics in Germany. It is, it is a great experience for our students to go compete o- uh, overseas. Newswatch starts now. Good evening. It's Rodeo Week in Edmonton and for local businesses that means a chance to rope in customers from around the world. The CFR and Farm Fair International injects tens of millions of dollars into our local economy. Our Angie Mellon joins us live from the South Lobby with more on that story. That's right, there was some concern that this would be the last year for the CFR. However, it was announced late last month that the CFR will be returning for another two years. This is welcome news for businesses specializing in Western wear and also businesses around Northlands looking to cash in this week. The bell ringing is a familiar sign of customers coming into Welsh's saddlery and Western wear during the Canadian Finals Rodeo. Probably we're going to spend $1,500 today, I would think. Seven, eight hundred dollars goes really fast. Customers are coming from all over to stock up on rodeo gear and get a head start on Christmas shopping, which is good news for Welsh's, one of many businesses benefiting economically by the rodeo being in town. People that do come in from out of town are buying for Christmas and that sort of thing too, so they're getting a start on all of that. So, you know, where if they're, you know, throughout the year they're buying one pair of jeans, maybe they're buying two or three now. You know, or they're buying that one pair of boots that they need to be replaced every year or every second year or whatever it is. So the purchases are tend to be a little bit bigger at this time of year. Canadian Professional Rodeo Association estimates approximately $50 million is brought in due to CFR and Farm Fair. However, businesses around Northlands are just happy to see customers coming in. <laughs> businesses like Coliseum Pizza and Steak are hoping to cook up big business this weekend. With hockey no longer at Rexall, staff say events like these bring in a good mix of customers. And on evenings before events, they're getting a dinner rush of 150 people. Some regulars that come for the rodeo or whatever, they like to participate in events. And then we have the out-of-towners too that come, like, that are actually in part of the events. Like we have, like, calf ropers and their families. As for Gary, he's happy the rodeo will be staying around for a few more years. I'm very happy it's back for another two years because I think it's great for Edmonton. And if they ever lost the rodeo, I think it would be terrible for the city of Edmond. A lot of people come in from out of town for CFR and Farm Fair, so hotels near Northlands are at capacity right now. And one hotel even told us they're already booking for next year. Angie, we found out a couple weeks ago the rodeo will stay in Edmonton until 2018. And now word this week of a brand new rodeo event for the summer. That's right, Northlands and the Canadian Professional Rodeo Association announced this week the K-Day Summer Rodeo. So athletes from Canada and the U.S. will be coming back to Edmonton to compete during July for three days. Angie, the CFR has been in Edmonton for 43 years and now the city is going to look into exactly how much money it brings in? Yes, Edmonton Tourism plans to conduct its first formal economic assessment. They say the results from this assessment should be available in a few months. Thanks, Angie. That's Angie Mellon reporting live from the South Lobby. You're watching Nate Newswatch. It was a week of remembrance in Edmonton as ceremonies were held to honor Canadians who have served our country. Hundreds gathered at the Beachmount Cemetery to recognize our fallen military and to educate students of the sacrifices veterans made. The campaign is organized by No Stone Left Alone Memorial Foundation, a nonprofit organization that works directly with the Canadian Armed Forces and educators across the country. Its mission, to place a poppy, the symbol of remembrance, on the headstones of every fallen soldier. Today it's not about supporting the war, about supporting any war but it's about standing beside our fallen with the same dedication and conviction they showed in serving their country, and it's about remembering them. This is the sixth year for the No Stone Left Alone ceremony. The campaign started in Edmonton in 2011, and now ceremonies are held at cemeteries right across our country. A musical salute honoring our veterans took place at City Hall. The 
Royal Canadian Artillery Band gave thanks to our veterans with the gift of music. This is just a way of us saying thank you to the veterans of all of the wars that are out there, those current serving members, and uh, for their families who stand behind them and support them while they're away. It's important for, to, for me to be here personally because uh, both my grandfather and my uncle both served in the military as engineers. The music played on as veterans and their families were in attendance during this heartwarming tribute to the fallen and to those who still fight. Americans weren't the only ones glued to their TVs this week. Edmontonians were also watching the U.S. election results closely. Some even gathered at the Garneau Theatre for the Americant election party to see the outcome. It was a party-like atmosphere as people watched the tight race between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. A panel of political commentators were present to share their views as the results came in. Uh, I think the whole world knows that what America does sort of affects everyone. Uh, and I think we have a lot of interest here because of how close we are. The party went late into the evening as it was after midnight before Donald Trump was declared the winner, making him the 45th president of the United States. Edmonton's rapid growth has an impact on everyone, including the animals. The Wildlife Rehabilitation Society works hard to get injured and displaced animals back to where they belong. Recently, they have seen a 10 to 15 percent increase in their animal intake. There are many factors that contribute to this, but animal contact with humans is a main one. Edmonton is a growing city, so as um suburbs grow, there's more roads, there's more buildings, and these are all things that impact wildlife. The society encourages people to move their bird feeders away from windows, drive cautiously, and check for animals living in their yard before doing yard work. For more information, you can visit their website at wildlife-edm.ca. Edmonton's favorite superhero, Spider Mabel, is swinging her way back into the city's hearts. Spider Mabel was honored this past Monday at City Hall by Mayor Don Iverson, where she accepted an art piece as a gift. She's a little girl who's battled cancer that made headlines last fall when she went on her city adventure thanks to the Children's Wish Foundation. A local production company is working on a documentary about her inspiring journey to become a superhero. As for Spider Mabel, she was just having fun with the day. I had a lot of fun today because everyone was here and it felt really special. Not very many kids get to do this. <laughs> if you want to learn more about the Spider Mabel documentary, you can check out their website at spidermabelthefilm.com. It's beginning to feel a little like Christmas in downtown Edmonton. The city's giant white spruce tree has arrived. The tree arrived Monday. Crews spent a couple of days decorating the 70-foot white spruce with more than 14,000 LED lights. Thousands of Edmontonians are expected to join Santa for the official lighting of the tree. I think everyone is always looking for an opportunity to have some fun and celebrate with friends and family and to make traditions. So I think that's why it's important to Edmontonians. I think Edmontonians have, em have embraced this event and they really enjoy it and we enjoy making it happen for them. The tree will remain lit for the holiday season. Santa will so be soon in the malls listening to every small child's wish for a Christmas troy. But thanks to 630 Ched's Santa's Anonymous, anyone could be Santa. The excitement is building at Santa's Depot with preparations underway for this holiday season. Volunteers are about to unwrap the magic once again. Beginning on November the 16th, we're open to the public right through till Christmas. And volunteers are required to help us pick the toys up from their donation locations, to sort them, to put batteries in them, to prepare them for our uh, individual children, and then to package them for the specific families. Before I came to the warehouse, I delivered toys. And some of the little kids, bring a tear to your eye. It's a very good thing. For more information on volunteering, go to santasanonymous.ca. Nate's culinary team had the winning ingredients at the Culinary Olympics in Germany.
The team returned with five medals, one gold, one silver, and three bronze. The team consisted of culinary arts students and instructors who competed against some of the best culinary schools in the world. More than 2,000 chefs were from 50 countries prepared more than 7,000 meals. Coming up after the break, all superheroes came out to an event for students, parents, and their kids. We see the various challenges that come with balancing life as a student and a parent. So, I spend the day here in the afternoon, go home to my second full-time job. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Smythe, and coming up for you in sports this week, the Canada-Russia series makes its way to Rogers Place, and the Edmonton Eskimos head east to take on the Tiger Cats in the playoffs. We've had an absolutely beautiful start to November with some of the warmest temperatures we've seen since the 1940s. But with temperatures expecting to start cooling down, you may have to put away your sunscreen, but do not pull out those winter mittens just yet. I have your weather report coming up next. It's been a record-breaking week this week in weather. This, this definitely is the nicest November I've ever seen. I know, and I can't even believe it's November, and I haven't even worn my winter jacket once. Audrey French has more on that in weather. That's right, guys. You definitely won't be needing those winter jackets this weekend because most areas in the province are going to be seeing double-digit temperatures, which is amazing for this time of year. Starting off in Calgary, we're going to be seeing a high of 13 and a low of 2 on Sunday. And moving now on to Jasper, a little bit cooler, but still great temperatures for the mountains. There's going to be a plus high, a plus nine for the high, and minus one for the low in Jasper. Now in Fort McMurray, temperatures are just a tiny bit cooler. Um, no precipitation, but it's gonna be a high of eight and a low of zero. Moving on now to the capital region, we're gonna be seeing a high of plus 10 and a low of one. So that is some amazing Edmonton weather here for the month of November. The averages for this time is plus two and a low of minus seven. And the records that we've seen in the city is high of plus 17 which was set in 1904 that was a while back and the low was minus 31 that was set in 1883 so we aren't far from that record high at all now this should be the last warm double digit weekend that we see for a while so definitely get out there and enjoy the weekend while it lasts i'm audrey french that's all for weather weather brought to you by nr92 the station for the students being a parent and a student at the same time seems like an impossible task. But there are a few superheroes who pull it off. They work tirelessly to make time for both their schoolwork and their kids. Our Joshua Berg has more on that story. Little superheroes were welcome for a day of fun at Nate's annual kids party. This event is put on by the Nate Student Association and this year's theme was superheroes. Parents and their kids enjoyed craft stations, games, movies, snacks, and a bouncy castle. This event is currently the only service Nate caters to its student parents. So we've been doing this event for a few years, and I think it was a, a parent that came to our office and was like, hey, like I have kids, um, I haven't really seen you guys do anything for them, so um, I think it just started from there. There are only about 40 kids who show up to this event and Nate doesn't take this as much of an indicator that services like childcare need to be provided, but they do see the potential need for more services like this as the campus grows. The balancing act of being a full-time student and a parent is far from easy. Kristen Howitt can vouch for this, saying her daily routine can be difficult. Well, it's not easy. Um, it's all about time management. It comes down to study time probably after he's in bed, making sure that he has my time when he's awake. For now, she appreciates what Nate has to offer. Kids can meet other kids, and she can also meet other parents in the same boat as her. I've met a few other people that have kids. I am an older student, so there isn't as many of us as there is you young ones, right? So <laughs> For each kid's party, the Nate Student Association records information from the parents who sign up. They do this so that when the parent population grows, Nate will be able to accommodate them more. For Nate Newswatch, I'm Joshua Berg. Wow, there certainly was a lot of lot happening on the ice this past week. And the Eskimos are gearing up for a huge playoff game out east. Isn't that right, Ethan? Well, that's right, guys. And I've got all that and more coming up for you in sports right now. So let's start things off with the annual CIBC Canada-Russia series, which made its Rogers Place debut on Tuesday. 
An early opportunity for Team WHL here. Nick Merkley set on a partial break by Sam Steele. Nothing to show for it though as Vladislav Sukachev flashes the leather with a great glove save. Not much else going on in the first period, so we go to the midway of the second, and here comes our first goal. Tyler Benson goes around the net. He's going to set up Kale Clegg, who rifles one past Sukachev. That's going to put Team WHL up in front. Not long after, Russia's looking to tie things up. Grigory Dronov takes a shot from the right wing. Philadelphia Flyers prospect Carter Hart doing as he did most of the night. He stands tall to the task. That'll keep the lead. They wouldn't have to wait too long to get on the board, however, as captain Danila Kvartalnov snipes one in the middle of the slot. That's going to even things up at one apiece. That's where we stood after 40 minutes of play. WHL regrouping in the locker room, and it didn't take long for them to get their lead back. Nick Merkley sets up captain Noah Yulsen on the doorstep. He taps this one in, and it's 2-1. Just over a minute later, and Team WHL strikes again as Austin Wagner gets on a breakaway, goes glove side on Anton Krasotkin. That was the insurance marker and the one to put Russia away. But it wouldn't be your typical Canada-Russia game without some fireworks. Game in the dying seconds, now 4-1, empty netter. And Nikita Dinyak and Lance Peterson square off. Regardless of who won that fight, though, it was Team WHL with the victory and a final score of 4-1. This concludes the two-game WHL portion of the series. Tyler Benson was the player of the game with a goal and two assists and made quick chemistry with unfamiliar players. Uh, it's good confidence-wise, and uh, I felt good today. Uh, I mean, it's tough coming to these games, uh, not only line mates, but I thought we played well tonight, and it was good to be able to create chances offensively. The Edmonton Eskimos are getting ready for the playoffs and a potential trip to the East Finals. With the regular season in the books, the Eskimos secured a playoff berth as the crossover team and will be heading to Tim Hortons Field tomorrow to face the Tiger Cats. It's the first time since 2014 that the CFL has had a crossover, and with their Grey Cup experience from last season, the Eskimos believe they're in a good spot. However, they also know that traveling east will be no easy task. No matter how far they're behind or how much they're up, they put it to you in the second half. And when you finish games like that, you know, you're tough to beat. And, and that's the way we look at them. They're, they're gonna, not going to be an easy out. We understand that. But our job is to go in there and beat them. If the Eskimos are successful, they'll head to the nation's capital the following Sunday for a great cup rematch against the Ottawa Red Blacks. The Nadukes women's volleyball team looked to even up their weekend series against the Keanu Huskies this past Saturday. Nate starts off well in the first set. Stacy Head sets up Christina Wanted for the attack. She puts it across to give the Ukes a 14-8 lead. They had a 20-9 lead at one point in the first set, but Piano closes the gap here. Nate unable to get this one past the net. However, they did get the set 25-21. Piano bouncing back in the second set, though. Sydney Svechenich's serve is sent back out of bounds by Milani Stang, and they take the second set by an identical scoreline, matching it up at one. We're in the fourth set now. Nate up 2-1, and Hannah Gorgachuk nails this serve on on set point, Keanu can handle it, and that'll give the Utes a three sets to one victory over the Huskies. The win helped the Ukes split the weekend series with Keanu after losing on Friday. Coach Ben Heinrichs was pleased with how his team closed out this match after splitting the first two sets. Different ways to win, like uh, that third set, we really took control and maintained it the whole way through, and fourth set, we figured out how to battle and, and win a close one. For this week's end zone challenge, I took to the pitch to learn some tricks on penalty kicks. Hi and welcome to the end zone challenge. I'm here today with Eric Munoz, the head coach of Jasper Place for soccer, and you're going to show me how to do penalty kicks today. Okay, let's get to it. Two theories, one of them very basic, pick a spot away from the goalie, usually at the corners. So just come up, pick your spot, see if you can place it to a side. Second theory is wait for the goalie to dive and then try to pick the opposite side as the goalie dives. So as you're approaching it, a goalie might try to cheat a certain way and if you see them cheating, then you try to go the opposite way. If you're gonna place one into the corners, I, what I, we suggest, typically uh, you can open up, put, use the inside of your foot, okay? That way you have better accuracy. You have to try to get your planting foot along the, along the side the ball so that by the time you make contact, your, your, your hips are square to the net. So power shot, you can hit across your body, which is, if I'm left footed, I'm shooting across my body to, to my right. If I'm right footed, I'm shooting to the left. Or you can keep it open, step in, and you can just try to power it. Okay, so strike through the ball. Hey, that's better. Right on. Yeah, it did, what? <laughs>
Oh, good save. All the best in your future endeavors. All Hopefully right. you, you get to take a penalty shot one day. Well, thank you so <laughs> much, Eric. This has been the End Zone Challenge. Thank you for watching. Well, I think it's safe to say I don't really bend it like Becca. <laughs> yeah, but that looked like a lot of fun to be a part of. Absolutely, but it looks like you were getting the hang of it near the end. Definitely. Thanks, guys. Coming up after the break, we help support the Boys and Girls Club by making some healthy snacks. The program called Kids in the Kitchen strives to encourage kids to make creative and healthy food choices. It's a program that puts together um, the opportunity for kids to learn a little bit about nutrition, a little bit about healthy living and diet, exercise, and then of course getting them in the kitchen. My name is Chantelle and coming up in entertainment, I show you an Edmonton-based arts exhibition. I bring you to the Canadian Jazz Festival and I show you what the Canadian Finals Rodeo has to offer for kids. Hair services provided by Rock Salon and Spa. At a young age, we are always told to eat our fruits and vegetables. Corey and I worked with the Boys and Girls Club for Kids in the Kitchen program to create some healthier eating choices. With red and green peppers, spinach, cucumbers, and hummus, kids were able to create their own style of pitas. Although these ingredients may not always be a popular choice when it comes to snacking, the chefs are hoping to help expand the kids' taste buds. The advice I would give is to like try every vegetable. Uh, a lot of kids have a preconception about different vegetables. Like today we've done the peppers that are roasted and a lot of them are like, uh, that seems kind of odd. But a lot of them, after they tried it, they're like, they wanted more of it just because they figured out, oh, it's delicious. In the end, this program hopes to encourage kids that trying something new can surprise you, even if it doesn't look appealing. With everyone talking about the rodeo this week, I wonder what cool events they have to offer this year. You know, I've been living in Edmonton my whole life and I've never been to the rodeo. So I hope our entertainment reporter Chantel can tell us what events are going on this week. Our Chantel has more in entertainment. It was a magical morning for many kids at the Northlands Coliseum this week. <laughs> With the rodeo's very busy schedule, competitors and Northlands volunteers took the time out of their day to buddy up with special needs kids in the community. The kids were taken on horse rides, had the chance to try barrel bronc riding, got their faces painted, and had their fair share to attempt at roping a bull. My favorite part is the horseback riding, cause, 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 cause the horse walks you around and you can ride on it, like the horse can run if you do this to the string on the horse. There were more than 150 kids that were between the ages of 6 and 14 that came to join the unique and fun activities. Rodeo Magic has been going on in Edmonton for more than 25 years. Local gamers came together this past weekend to raise funds to give an extra life to the Stollery Children's Hospital. Last Saturday morning was the start of the worldwide annual 24-hour gaming marathon and the Extra Life Edmonton team hosted this event at West Edmonton Mall. Gamers can fundraise throughout the year, but for one weekend they band together for a super charity drive. Participants sign up individually or in teams to reach a fundraising goal by the end of the 24 hours. Gamers bring their own, own console, video games and even board games to the event, but some people can even stay at home to participate in this great cause. Actually, there's lots of teams um, in Edmonton who will well, be smaller teams of four or five people and they'll just do it from like almost have a, a land party at their house or something. So you don't have to show up to the big event and you know with all the hundreds of people, uh, I just enjoy it. I like the atmosphere and I like the events they put on. Some gamers streamed at the event, some played arcade games, and some played in tournaments like Rock Band or Halo on the big screen. This year, due, due to daylight saving, gamers played for a total of 25 hours. The event itself raised over $84,000 for the Stollery. If you are into the smooth sounds of jazz, Edmonton has the perfect festival that happens to be when most mu fix music festivals are over. <laughs> The 10th annual Yardbird Festival of Canadian Jazz highlights Canadian and local artists. 
The volunteer run festival happens every year at the beginning of November to give guests the jazz experience outside of the musical events that happen during the summer. The festival is great, the gig is great, the jam is great, but it's happening because of the Yardbird Suite and the not-for-profit Edmonton Jazz Society that exists to serve the broader jazz community. Musicians are grateful that the world-renowned club provides time and space to continue to collaborate with others year-round and keep their feet tapping. Every night during the festival, different groups play from 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. and the event wraps up tomorrow. The Edmonton Arts Council is giving an exciting opportunity for multicultural, indigenous and emerging artists to display their work on a unique local scale through an urban art exhibition called Hashtag Yeg Canvas. 38 Edmonton artists came together to celebrate their work that was chosen out of hundreds of art submissions. The total of 45 pieces made the cut and will be displayed on 10 different billboards and 15 LRT station posters throughout a six month period. Many artists like Eric Chung think that hashtag Yeg Canvas is such a great way to have more Edmonton art seen by everyone, even if you aren't into the art community. Besides exhibiting in, in um, sort of venues, other venues, this is a more wide, um, it, it hits a more wider audience. The art is varied in terms of watercolor, photography and drawings. And all the artwork will be rotated between billboards and posters every two months so that the whole city can have a chance to marvel at their hard work. That's all I have for entertainment this week. I hope you enjoy the rest of your long weekend. And there's one more day left of the rodeo, so try and catch the last couple events with your family. The Ribbon Rouge Foundation held a VIP night to promote its Art for Action benefit to raise HIV awareness. The evening contained a blend of music, special guests and art to help start a dialogue. The awareness raised uh, promotes the reduction in stigma of living with this disease and gets people um, motivated to get out and get tested and have more dialogue about the virus. I'm here tonight to support the great work of Ribbon Rouge and Arts for Action and their uh, commitment to making sure that we use arts as a way to share important messages. The Arts for Action benefit will take place on November 24th. Well, that's it for our show this week. We appreciate you joining us. Thanks for watching.